Hello and welcome to another episode of Quarantine with Fulbrighters where we get Fulbrighters from all over Pakistan to come and talk to me about the work they're doing and we have another one of these phenomenal Fulbrighters here with us. Uh, it's quite an honor and a privilege to have Dr. Rafiq here with us. How are you doing, sir? I'm fine. Thank you very much, Shazad, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir, for coming on. Uh, I'm quite interested to talk about libraries today. It's a it's, uh, one of our safe spaces for people who were uh, readers growing up, but it's something that doesn't get talked about a lot. Uh, you have you have just recently published this phenomenal research, so can, let's begin from there. What is the research about? Yes, actually, uh, as you are well aware that pandemic, this COVID-19, it affected the whole world and uh, there were, you, we can say there's a catastrophic uh, impact on the society, uh, particularly on education sector. So we planned uh, this uh, research, me and my team, and uh, we explored that what uh, were the responses of the university libraries in terms of uh, COVID-19, because uh, it affected a lot, and particularly in context of Pakistani universities, they were uh, based on face-to-face -face interactions, face-to-face -face mm -hmm. teaching mode, and it was really, a, you can say, the paradigm shift how we will shift to from face to face to online teaching and so on. So uh, it was very much, it was felt very much necessary to explore this area. And uh, our uh, topic was the university library's response to COVID-19 pandemic. And particularly we believe that a developing country perspective that is our context, that is a unique. Uh, as we are well aware that uh, developed countries libraries and their institutions, they are already, uh, they have come, uh, wonderful infrastructure, mm. uh, policies are there and even technical support is there, but we lack in the, these areas. So uh, that was our research and the purpose was to explore that how libraries are working in this pandemic, how they are offering the services and what are their services more as well as uh, uh, how, uh, what are their working practices. So we explored in depth uh, by uh, doing, by conducting in depth interviews of top seven uh, university libraries in Pakistan. And so, and it, this uh, uh, research is published in uh, our impact factor journal, one of the top tier journal of our profession, that is Journal of Academic Librarianship. It yeah. appeared in uh, uh, January uh, issue of uh, this journal. If, if we can get a sneak peek into the journal of what the research showed, how were the libraries operating um, during the pandemic? Because from the outside, I would assume, having gone through the system in Pakistan, that they were just top operating. Uh, that's actually, uh, if we see in context of Pakistan, the higher education sector mm -hmm. uh, is the largest consumer uh, we have in higher education sector that use information. So uh, libraries are very much in. And uh, as the university libraries were, uh, universities were closed and the libraries were closed, but the research work was going on. Many researchers, particularly postgraduate researchers, they were looking for some help from the uh, information providers, particularly libraries, because they were working on their research projects on a regular basis. They cannot delay on these uh, their research projects. So uh, libraries were actually, uh, as we are well aware that in uh, February, first COVID case was reported in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And from March, our universities, uh, as well as the libraries, they were closed for the users. And in this case, um, HEC and um, other um, uh, epic bodies of higher education administration, they issued some, you can say the memos, the memorandums, as well as the policy statements that universities need to switch over to online education. But education cannot complete without the provision of the related study material as well as the course reserves and so on. So university libraries uh, were also looking for their uh, working practices to refine, to uh, help out the uh, end consumer and so on. So libraries, what they did actually, uh, as the pandemic started and online education started, they, um, 
they became the part of uh, uh, faculty. They coordinated uh, with the faculty members as well as the other uh, coordinators. There, um, uh, for example, PhD coordinators, MPhil coordinators, and so mm -hmm. on. And they try to um, play their role in a very best way. And even they established uh, uh, online uh, groups. They revamped their web pages and they connected with the user. Even most importantly, libraries tried. They did not wait for the policies. They just tried to uh, reach their end user. Even uh, that user is either living in cities, either they were living in very uh, rural areas, very far flung areas from uh, campuses. And they tried to uh, help out to fulfill their information needs by providing, by scanning uh, pages and providing the users, by uh, getting the um, online materials and providing through emails as well as WhatsApp and other social media tools and so on. So they were very much in. Even they, uh, they were working from homes. In my study, we explored their, their working practices and we found that they were uh, working from home and uh, our respondents, they said it that after the, this uh, pandemic, during this pandemic, they were very much occupied. Even they were uh, supposed to respond uh, in off times. So they were working 24 hours during our interview. It was really very I much, guess. you can say that a community service that they felt and they prompted very swiftly they prompted. I think that's been a problem for a lot of Pakistanis that once work ended and they had they couldn't go to the office, work never ended. They were working throughout. So once yes. those office hours got removed, you were in the office all day. And the notion that you would stop working at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. or even 10 p.m. went out the window. I'm assuming a lot of this is a Pakistan-specific problem because I did my Fulbright from Brooklyn College, New York. Uh, you did your post-grad postdoc from State University of New York in Buffalo. So we were and neighbors. Buffalo. We were Buffalo, neighbors. Yes. We were not that yes. far away. Um, but so my research was on Pakistan and I always struggled to find information or archives which were to do with Pakistani history, uh, Pakistani theater performances, Pakistani reviews. But anytime I had to research most other countries, all the information would already be available online. So in terms of academia, that that notion that you have to be physically in a library to do your research, especially in a country like America, that notion is out of the window because people are researching from all around the world at their university and all that information is available to them. So this, this, this problem faced by researchers in Pakistan, is this quite a Pakistan specific problem that our digitization is so weak? Actually, uh, libraries from last decades, if we see, although uh, the world says 90s and 20, uh, 2000s a decade, they say it are decades of a digitization. But uh, we can say digitization in Pakistan, in this area of the world, it started in, from 2010 to onward, major projects that we see. But there are certain issues. For example, majority of our resources that are residing in the libraries, we don't uh, have the copyright. So if we don't have the copyright, we cannot digitize it and to publish it, to make it available mm -hmm. uh, online. And uh, uh, this was the major issue because majority of the, our uh, resources that are residing in the library that, that are paper-based are in analog form. They are not digitized. And uh, in this case, for example, one of the very important um, findings was that, that in, during this pandemic, majority of the libraries who have a lot of resources, particularly in terms of print resources, as well as resources, technical resources for digitization, they were capable more from mm -hmm. others in, contact, in comparison with others. They were in a better, in better mood to serve the user's needs. They digitized uh, a few pages, sometime a chapter and provided to the uh, users, particularly in social sciences. And what about others open access resources? They helped a lot to, uh, libraries, uh, to librarians uh, to fulfill the information needs of the users as well as HTC Digital Library was also there. 
to help the user. But of course, digitization, as we recommended, the digitization project should be started in the libraries and they need it in terms of sustainability and they need to plan it for a long-term basis. So in terms of things we do not have copyrights for, the problem is just financial because those resources would be available online, not through Pakistan, but through either buying that book or through foreign libraries or through um, registrations to journals like JSTOR, those resources would at least be available online. What about Pakistani resources, uh, research that Pakistanis have produced? Um, literally, there are mountains of theses that students have written in universities, which are just laying there, gathering dust. Is there any desire or will to digitize all of that so that that is available to researchers all around the world? Uh, actually, uh, as I understood, because there was some interruption in your voice, as I understood, basically, Pakistani libraries to uh, adopt, uh, you can say the multi-tier approach, they mm. need to work to digitize their own resources. And they also need to work on copyright issues. They mm. may uh, coordinate, they may talk to the publishers and digitize their resources, as well as they also need to acquire uh, new resources in electronic formats. Yes. Particularly, Pakistani libraries, if we see their collection development policies, they are based on print-based resources. And what they acquire on regular basis, on annual basis, majority of resources are there, uh, particularly in terms of books and textbooks. They are uh, related to, uh, they are in print formats. During this, as uh, our respondents uh, talked to us, they mentioned that major many of the uh, uh, their users and users they were demanding particularly course uh, textbooks, and and they mentioned that they don't have the textbooks in majority of the cases in electronic formats. So we recommend that they need to work on it. They need to particularly make uh, policy uh, arrangements to acquire the electronic resources because such resources may help the libraries to uh, fulfill the information needs, particularly in mm -hmm. such uh, pandemics. So for Pakistani researchers who are trying to research things from all around the world, the cost of these journals, these subscriptions are quite exorbitant. Yes. But on the flip yeah. side, isn't that a great opportunity for libraries? So, for instance, Pakistani research exists. If they're able to digitize that, they can make that research available to the international research community and charge a premium for that because that resource is really not available online at all. Yes. Yes, this is the area area of opportunity, I would say, that uh, the uh, particularly, for example, the journals that are publishing from Pakistan, mm -hmm. they need to be digitized, they need to be available, not only their future uh, issues, but also their back issues. Yes. And uh, because we hold the copyright of these contents and so on. Uh, in these years, HEC worked on it. HEC issued policy statements and they pushed the journal. I'm also the editor of our uh, one of the journal that is HEC recognized and Scoopus Index Journal. We, I, I'm well aware that uh, HEC is pushing the uh, journal to go to go for uh, online access, and uh, many uh, journals in recent particularly in the last couple of years, they switched, they adopted open journal system and they switched to uh, online publishing and so on. Of course, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity as uh, we need to showcase our research, our output, and we can do it through electronic means, through digital means. We need to uh, make sure that our uh, contents that we publish, that Pakistani authors publish, they can. Uh, uh, there should be available. For example, uh, I would say uh, beyond this, even uh, my research, this is a, a common thing that we are able to find the research around the world. We are able to find, find. but even the resources that the research that is published in Pakistan, particularly in print journals, 
we are it's very hard to find it yes. it's very hard to find it and sometimes you go for uh, some some sort of snowball so sampling you go uh, you connect to one person and that person actually direct you to connect you to other person and then you are able to find it because they, these are not digitized but of course digitization is the future we need to switch over on it second one second point is open access open access facilitated a lot particularly developing countries they are able to get access to the latest literature in science and particularly in science uh, scientific areas uh, to fulfill the information needs of their users but we also need to think about that we uh, start such initiatives for example institutional repositories green open access that facilitate that i publish for example my faculty member i, I if i publish my institution usually they are allowed to uh, harvest uh, my publication in their repository but institutional repositories lack in such cases university administration need to provide funding they need to provide other uh, support to the library so they can initiate such repositories and the publication that their uh, people their faculty members as well as their students they publish they should be the part of their repository and that repository should be available and there are also i teach um, technology related courses there are certain uh, content management solutions softwares for example one of the very famous is dspace that is available uh, from mit and um, that is free of cost open access journal and repost such uh, softwares we may use to build such a repository that will be available online but of course there again financial resources is will be required from the institution that may be provided by the university as well as from the hcc to facilitate such initiatives to finance such initiatives and so on so you were at the state university of new york so i'm assuming when you went to library.buffalo.edu your library gave you access to the entire new york university circuit because when i was at brooklyn and there was yes. a book at hunter college i could order it whether yes. it be online whether it be physical so can't we do the same where hcc for all the hcc universities builds a network where hcc actually gets these subscriptions i think the debate whether all scientific academic journals should be free or should be charged is maybe a longer debate and we may get to that but for now if this is the system that we live in where you have to pay a subscription fee what if hcc pays that and then creates a library.hcc.edu.pk that is accessible to all the universities in the network just like uh, it happened with buffalo and brooklyn and hunter and in the new york university circuit yes we can do and it's i would say that um, our librarians are ready our libraries are ready even our scholarly community is ready mm. but uh, what is lacking actually we are lacking the policy interventions hcc should intervene and hcc should issue a policy when there will be a policy our institutes will be able to fund such uh, initiatives hcc i would i strongly recommend your point that we should need to establish resource sharing networks we yes. need to establish interlibrary loan facilities interlibrary loan consortia and so on we also need to cultivate uh, collaborative projects to cultivate partnerships with, within the libraries and among the universities to work on these areas to offer open access to our resources as well as to create information to make it available and to establish such resource sharing network and i want to add that such networks has the potential to save our money for example a very raw example i will say uh, my library if uh, they buy a book and the same library with other department that is just behind just uh, on side of my department they also create, uh, purchase same library uh, book and we actually wasted the resources why not a central consortia they make it happen that if something is available in a one departmental library and that is in electronic format that may that book may be used by other departments too and that such repositories such setups of resource sharing networks they may facilitate unfortunately in pakistan we lack in such uh, resource sharing networks 
So uh, I believe that such resource sharing networks and the consortia approach among the libraries, among the universities, that may solve uh, us, say, solve many problems of us. And particularly, they may prepare us to face such pandemics in future. I absolutely get the classical fear that universities may have, even uh, having gone to one of the big universities. Still, at times, you had to wait to get a book. So if universities classically made the argument that we do not have enough books just to cater to our own students, how can we be part of a resource sharing network? But once you move to digitization, you're not actually going to the university and checking out a book and checking the fines and checking when the due date is. It's all electronic. So even if you send that electronically to 13 people, you're not losing out on much, except maybe yes, exactly. an idea of exclusivity that only students who are part of this university may have access to that. Uh, and I think those are small egotistical issues that probably we can set aside for the greater good. I'm not sure if we would be able to, but I hope we can. What is your take on the capitalist model of academic journals? Should, should all of them be free? Actually, in my personal point of view, and it's also open access is one of my uh, research area. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, for my one of my students, uh, he is working on uh, open access journals in Pakistan. His PhD dissertation is related to uh, it. Mm -hmm. And um, a couple of empirical uh, theses that were recently uh, completed that are also on open access. Ex open access, it has two faces. This coin has two faces. One is access and user access. Second one is publishing. I want to mention in terms of publishing, there is a very big problem for Pakistani scholars. For example, this article that you are talking in context of that article we are, we are talking about, uh, this Journal of Academic Librarianship, when I was submitting this article, uh, there was a uh, provision that I may publish it uh, through open access mode. And the charges was 1,800, I think, so $76. That yes. you had to pay to publish but, your research on open yes, access for free. Yes, exactly. This is a gold access, a gold open access model that author pays it for it and the end user, they use it free. But for example, in Pakistan, a professor, especially mid-career professor, what he gets, I think so, his monthly income is less than this 1,870. Absolutely. How he or she can publish it? In such terms, again, HEC and other government institutions, they need to support. Although my university provide the funding, they provided, for example, we are four authors. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay, they will just, my uh, university will allow me to sponsor uh, through university means, through university financial sources, just my part of that. But as you, we are well aware, my authors are all from Pakistan and I know very well. So I did not opt for open access publishing. I opted for just, uh, uh, other model that is a capitalist. What is the logic that. here? Because it, from the outside, it seems nonsensical to make the author pay for their work to be available online for free to other researchers. I, I just don't get the logic. Where are they coming from? Why are they charging this fee? What is this fee for? Actually, uh, that is also a, there is a reason. For example, the publisher that make it available mm -hmm. and it will be available till the infinite time, we can say, and the publisher is paying something to keep it online. So uh, the publisher charge this fee to make it available uh, uh, freely for the end user. So they charge from the author. There are actually uh, two models, basic, basically two mm -hmm. models. Gold open access where the author or his or her institution pays the fee of publishing. And the other is uh, uh, green open access where it is available, but available not uh, openly, available for the uh, institution of the author. They make it available. They make it the part of my publication, my mm -hmm. institution, they make it part of their institutional repository and make it available for their community. 
So uh, gold open access is very much, uh, you can say the growing as well as the green open access, but um, majority of the sources, for example, nature, recently I read a report, the nature journal is going to charge 7,000 plus pounds for a publication for a, and I believe who will publish it? Who will publish from Pakistan? For example, um, in my university, it will be very hard. So this is the second phase. And um, I don't want to disclose, but I am going to disclose that why, inshallah, I'm going to publish it uh, on this aspect, that this how this is neg this open access negatively affecting the authors, in particularly in developing countries. So uh, this is the issue. Of course, what I recommend, HEC should constitute a uh, committee and it commit, this committee should not be just the big, they should not gather just the big names. They should need the researchers in this area and they should sit together and make a policy and uh, HEC should intervene in it because this is going to happen. This is happening actually and open access is blooming everywhere. And we need to address the issues that we, particularly from developing countries, we face because we have to survive and we have to flourish. Not only the survival, we have to flourish. So unless uh, the institutions and the, uh, such epic bodies of higher education, they address these areas, I believe we will not be on forefront. I think it's lovely to see it's lovely to see such a holistic perspective from you. You're so cognizant of all the different factors that go into this work. How did the Fulbright postdoc help you think about all of these factors when it comes to your work? Actually, uh, Fulbright helped me a lot. I was there uh, from December 2017 till December 2018. I witnessed, I observed, and uh, I have gone through their practices, their library setup, and uh, uh, as well as the research, uh, how they are doing, and how their institutions are supporting them, how their uh, other donors are supporting them. Uh, and on the basis of that, you make a plan. There are actually many, um, I believe you will agree with me because you also spent there a lot of uh, new ideas you get there. You get uh, networking, you, you do networking with other people and they support your ideas, they work with you and you create new things with, uh, in context of your local uh, integration, local problems and so on. So uh, that Fulbright experience that helped me to understand, to go through this, you can say the some sort of ideal environment for mm -hmm. search culture and to frame it according to your local context, to add it and make something better for our, your next generations. And I really appreciate this USCFP and the Fulbright organization and so on. That's precisely it. I keep uh, repeating the same cliche, but it's an experience as opposed to just an education. Uh, everything that you see there, everything that you uh, learn and every person that you talk to is a learning experience. So thank you, sir, for everything that you do and everything that you've learned and brought back. Uh, it's, it's not something that we consciously think about. But without libraries, there would be no research, there would be no publications, and we wouldn't move forward as a society. So thank you so much for taking care of this important pillar of academia. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us and letting us know. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for giving me a chance to speak. And it was really a pleasure for me. It was, it was lovely to speak to you, sir. And thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll be back again next week with another Fulbright. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.